Uh, welcome everyone to Simplifying Backend Agility uh, through the lens of transitioning from Debezium Elasticsearch to Postgres or Streamlined Re Resilience. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Hambridge. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I work on console.redhat.com services. Uh, I've been with Red Hat for seven years. Before that, I was with uh, IBM for 11 years. So my uh, career is officially 18 years old. We can vote now, which is exciting. Uh, when I turned 18 myself, I was, I was given the birthday present of appendicitis. I spent the, uh, the evening in the OR. So today happens to be my 41st birthday. So I get public speaking as this, this year's humorous universe uh, uh, attribute. So thank you, universe, for that. It's the top 10 for most people in terms of things that are going on. Let's, let's jump into it, though. Uh, what did all those words in the title mean? Uh, it may be that I won marketing bingo. Uh, it may be that that was one of the reasons why people read the proposal. It might be why people may or may not have showed up to this. Uh, but really, this is a, a talk, yes, specifically around some of what my project did, but also so that a, a person on a team who's maybe had a project that has reached a certain level of maturity, can have some takeaways from this, uh, or somebody starting a new project can look at it through the lens of what to do, what not to do. Uh, back in college, I took a course called uh, The History of Art. And I may have selected it because it was in a, a nice hall where the lights were turned off and it was slideshow. It was the middle of the day, like right after lunch. Prime napping time, sure. But it did come with things where I learned like minimalism in terms of architecture and art, uh, which has that tagline of less is more. And so that's kind of part of this conversation. It's that if, you're, if people on your engineering team can't give that five minute elevator pitch, you might be in a case where the complexity of your project has come too high that it starts to slow down your development of new features, your ability to solve bugs because people aren't sure what the kind of tie-on effect would be to those changes. So really, the high level of this is identifying and re removing impediments. The idea that even great technology, if it's too complex, can become bad technology. It can slow you down. But let's talk about the use case that's involved in this Debezium Elasticsearch to Postgres piece. So I mentioned before I work on console.redhat.com. Specifically, I work in the Red Hat Insights product family. Uh, it's really a management services layer for different Red Hat products, whether it be OpenShift or RHEL or Ansible. But this use case was specifically looking at those that are in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux family. Um, in that case, we have a common inventory for all of those systems, but then we have associated services, management services that allow you to see different issues that might have come up in terms of configuration, vulnerabilities, malware, but they all have that shared inventory across it. So for our case, if you know anything about Elasticsearch Debezium, it's around creating this sync of data and being able to, being able to join that data of those disparate uh, data sources together in order to view that information. And that's important from a, we need to be able to do filtering consistently, we need to be able to do pagination, we need to be able to do sorting. And for all those things to come together, if they're not in a co-located database, you run into different issues along the way. So let's start with some, some deeper context, but still at a high level around the architecture. So if you're not familiar with Debezium, this is a high level of uh, what it is. It's a distributed platform for change data capture. And what that means is you have a source database and you're capturing row level changes. And then you have a sync, and usually those are connected through something like Kafka. And you have Kafka Connect on either side, transporting that, those changes across. Uh, in our case, we have Postgres on, on, one, on, on one side and Elasticsearch on the other. But then later, you'll actually hear we also had Postgres on the other side too, which is pretty cool. That was sarcasm for those that didn't understand that. <laughs> um, so looking at this, console.redhat.com is a series of microservices. 
For those that don't know what microservices are, it's basically independent layers. You might have an API that the, uh, the user interacts with, but they're not aware of kind of that underlying architecture. These different microservices all have their own databases backing them, uh, but they have like shared identity. Uh, in front of a, this kind of RESTful APIs, we have an API manager so that every user that's interacting with it, they're gonna see console.redhat.com slash API. Uh, they're not aware that the inventory service has its own API layer, that advisor has its own API layer. Uh, so if we walk through, we've got customers on the left, they have those systems that we've mentioned in, in the common inventory. They're running an agent typically on it. It's sending payloads up through our ingress service. Those payloads then get processed. The ingress service does more than this, but it, it, it get, for us, it gets per, uh, processed by HUP2, which I don't even know what that was meaning when they named it, but that's what we named it, so you get to see that today. It takes two pieces of information. It finds the hosts that are there, and it also sends the rest, the engine, for those rules so that we can identify those different issues that we mentioned in terms of like malware, advisor uh, rules, those configuration drifts, the other recommendations that we might have along the way to be remediated. The data goes into an inventory where we have our consistent set of systems. Postgres is our source of truth. And then we have uh, Kafka Connect, which I said was our mechanism for routing data across Kafka. And that goes into Elasticsearch. So there's Kafka Connect either side, source and sync being able to say, we want to pull this data from the database, read it into Elasticsearch on the other side. Uh, down here at the bottom, you'll note there's a search API. It's written in, it's a GraphQL API. So we interestingly have REST that comes in. We transform it into GraphQL so that we can search it out of Elasticsearch. And then we transform it back into a REST API. Up top, you'll see that we have a cross-join operator. Cross-join was that idea of we wanted to join all of this data across the different applications. What that operator does is it maintains the replication and the elastic, uh, the, the Kafka Connect pieces between uh, the inventory database and Elasticsearch. And why I only call, call out the inventory database is after four years, the only data that ever ended up in Elasticsearch was inventory. We never managed to get the other application data in there. Uh, and that's because along the way, things became a bit too complex for the team to be able to kind of do the lift to get things uh, into Elasticsearch. So if you've read staff engineering or you know about that, uh, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a staff engineer. Uh, I typically have an architect role for a couple of the different services, but those services are actually on the OpenShift side of the world. So I wasn't really involved with the Red Hat Enterprise Linux side of management services, though I had been on console dot since kind of its inception of as a platform. Um, so my boss came to me one day and kind of in the solver role, if you're familiar with that, and he said, cross join makes me sad. He said, should we kill it? And I said, Maybe, I don't know, Let's, I'll have to look into it because I desperately didn't know anything about it. Um, so what was my next task? It was a technical analysis and review because I believe that any manager saying you should go do this is a bad reason to take it to the rest of the engineering team. Uh, they might be wrong. It may have just been, hey, how do we make this easier for development purposes? So. Uh, my next plan was talk to the people, right? All of them, all the engineers. Uh, I had to have adequate background knowledge. Like I said, I had been on the platform for a while, so I had the base information of how things worked, but I had to kind of dive a bit deeper. But then performing one-on-one -on -one interviews was really, interviews was really key uh, to ask focused questions. And the reason I bring that up is if you have a big group of people, you t typically get, you know, like Yelp reviews, the people who are passionate about one side or the other, but the people who maybe are newer to the team or maybe they don't like to speak up, they won't say anything. It'll just be dead quiet. And actually, the people who are newer on the team or the people who really feel unsure about the technologies, they'll be the ones that give you the most valuable input in terms of how do we, what are the imp actual impediments and what do we need to do to remove them. Now, along the way, I asked for different pain points and for ideas, right? Any ideas, welcome. Uh, how can we 
you know, move forward? What were their suggestions? Was it just documentation? Did we need to do X, Y, and Z? But I also wanted to know what my constraints were for those changes. So for me, I had to consider compliance and regulation issues. We had to talk about cost. I had to think about things like team skill and common market skills. And the reason I say common, mar common market skills is because attrition happens, right? Teams change and evolve over time. Priorities at companies change such that maybe your star developer goes into some other area or maybe you need to find new gaps. And if your pro project is built on technology that it makes it hard to find and fill that gap, then you're gonna also slow down your ability to deliver new functionality or bug fixes. So those were critical things in terms of how do we move forward, how we have those conversations. So let's talk briefly about some of our important outcomes. So I did mention compliance and regulation. So we have an instance of console dot that runs in FedRAMP high. And that means that it is a highly sensitive, non-classified data area on the, on the cloud for the US government. And making any, any changes there comes with the significant change request, which is months and lots of people worth of work. So if I say, let's switch out X technology with Y technology and it's brand new, that's a lot of money and a lot of people's time being spent. So I was constrained in not introducing new technologies to solve the problem. Or at least that was the direction to use, right? What were outcomes that we could move forward with that? Costs. Cross-join was, or at one time, the most expensive service, uh, primarily due to the last uh, search cluster. So, you have to have a pretty large cluster to handle the volume of data that we're talking about, the volume of requests, and we certainly didn't want to replace it with how do we spend more than that thing because that was part of the pain, right? It was, hey, we've got this technology, uh, it's super expensive, and with added expense, we can do less, right? You, can you can can't hire more people, so cost savings was, was gonna be a win, right? If we can make it cheaper, then let's move forward with that. Uh, the next thing we talked that I was looking at here and that we talked about was just the number of languages and technologies. So that core uh, inventory code was Python based. Uh, all of the Kafka Connect pieces are Java. Some of the uh, schema registry and search stuff has JavaScript in it. The operator is Golang. You have to understand Kafka. You have to know about Elasticsearch. You have to understand GraphQL. You have to understand operators, which not everybody does. You have to be familiar with Postgres, Flask, SQL Alchemy. And this is a single team that owns all of that work and all the moving pieces for it. So their ability to move rapidly is it's tough, right? And that's, that was one of the biggest issues. One of the other things that came up was vulnerabilities in open source. So during the time of us developing this, Elasticsearch changed its license. People might be familiar with that. More recently, people may have heard about Redis changing its license. So we had a version, we had the old version of Elasticsearch running on a cloud provider. Uh, that meant that at some point, if we were going to keep this going, we were going to either A, buy a license from Elastico, or B, be anchored into that cloud provider's specific implementation of their Elasticsearch, which then means we are no longer hybrid cloud, drop and replace anywhere. Also makes our ability to do local development harder because is there a mechanism that we can swap out for you know, local Elasticsearch containers for that. Uh, beyond that, there was this big issue of how much staff do we have in upstream communities for CVE fixes. So I mentioned all of the pieces that we were using Debezium for, we constantly had CVEs against them. Not that there's anything wrong with Java, but Java pulls in a lot of libraries and it's just one of those things where if you pull in something that it's a large enough project, you have a lot of changes that go along the way. 
And when we were when we're in FedRAMP high, those CVEs have to get resolved even faster. So that's even less time that the developers have to spend on developing and more that they're just resolving these CVEs over and over. So the other outcome was around skill up and delivery time. And I mentioned before, this is kind of tied into the number of languages and technologies that were involved. We had several different goes where we tried to go to the V2 or add new capabilities in for those other application services, but it took too long for people to skill up for our, us to be able to make dates, and then we had to shift priorities, and sometimes it led to short-term hacks. And I say hacks in a friendly way, it does work, but I mentioned before that on the other end of that architecture diagram, diagram we actually ended up with Postgres, meaning we had made a Postgres, Postgres re replication through Kafka using change data capture instead of using an underlying technology that's actually built into Postgres itself. The other thing here was morale and the risk here. Uh, so a lot of the stakeholders and associated team members, they just dislike the complexity, right? I mean, they have to live with this day in, day out, and they want things to change in order to, to move forward positively. So they have to have that direction from the team saying, what are we gonna do to make things better? Otherwise, it, attrition maybe increases. We also had the case where the belief amongst most of the team was there was a lead engineer, and that was the only person who understood how everything worked in their head. And there is a big risk if you lose that person because then you just have the other shoe drop, you have operational issues happen, and people are left uncertain as to what their approaches will be to solve those problems. So with the guys that we had a limited set of stuff that we could do in FedRAMP High, we said, let's explore Postgres alternatives because we had Postgres there already. So we're gonna walk through three things that we talked about as a team that were decent things for us to reach the same kind of functionality of being able to handle that co-located data that you could sort, you could filter, you could um, shape across those different uh, applications. So database consolidation, logical replication, and foreign data wrapper. All right, through this process, we first started out with engineering spikes because you can't just say we're gonna do something and nobody really understand how it works or if it's vetted that it's possible or feasible to work. So we did prototypes and demos. Uh, so people would share prototypes or demos. One engineer built a Git repo where they were showing off how foreign data wrapper worked and they didn't actually, they didn't do it within the code base that of, of insights itself. They just said, let me pull together a Postgres container A with movie information in it, like IMDB, and another one that actually had actor information in it. And then they, they showed how you pull this down, you run a couple commands to set up the remote and uh, local server, and then you can actually do your, your SQL queries across both, like the data was, was co-located. And that meant that everybody on the team could go through and get familiar with how the technology worked. They weren't just watching a YouTube video here or reading a, a, a blog, right? They could, they could touch and feel it for themselves. The next thing we did was look and talk more about the advantages and disadvantages of each. And this was a fun part of the conversation. Uh, lots of smart people engaged asking interesting questions. Uh, so we were focused on like, what does the development look like when you're doing this? What are my migration strategies uh, around the different pieces? Because different, different choices here uh, have different operational costs along with them. What does the operational life cycle look like? You're upgrading your database. You have maintenance windows, all of those fun things. Uh, what are the performance implications, the points of failure? What limitations do the different technologies have? So as we walk through each of these, the first one we looked at was database consolidation. So some of the advantages here were there's no data duplication here, right? All the data is in one database. Uh, there's no network traffic where you're going to fetch the data from anywhere or you're copying data from one place to another. But the huge disadvantages here are we have microservices today moving that data 
in essentially real time, even through a maintenance window, is super tough. And even if we do it one microservice at a time, it's still tough because we have an onslaught of systems constantly checking in and we just build and build that queue over time. We process roughly 1.4 million systems uh, every day, you know? And so you shut down for several hours to do a, a migration of data, then you have those kind of issues of how do you process through that and can continue to uh, handle real-time data? You know, not impact your customers along the way. So the other piece here, the another big issue is monolith, the monolith, monolithic database. So you can only scale so large in a cloud provider. You can only get so many vCPU, so much memory. If you have one service in a shared database that has a rogue index that they create, has a customer that writes a query that goes crazy 24-7, you're not only in, in, impacting that service, you're impacting all the other services that are sharing that database. It's not you know, like a super be best practice here, though some, there are some definite articles about create, stop microservices, go back to a monolithic app. But in this case, when you're running on you know, cloud architecture, cloud in infrastructure, you have to know what your constraints are and you can only uh, vertically scale so big. So the next thing we talked about was logical replication. So in this case, this is again, you have a, uh, a publisher database and a subscriber database and you want to move data from one to the other. This allows you to treat uh, data as a developer like you have co-located data. Logical replication, pretty cool technology. Uh, it's again what I mentioned we were kind of doing but in a roundabout way but you can do it where you can replicate all of the data in the database. You can select specific tables. You can choose to select tables with a specific where clause, so you're only getting certain rows out of that table uh, that are moving the data. You can select such that you're only sending certain columns across, so you can really constrain the amount of data and what's being replicated along the way. Uh, you have a nice thing here in terms of advantage from logical replication is outage isolation. If the publisher database goes down for any reason, you have the data still as the subscriber. You're as recent as the replica, you know, uh, as the last replication, but you're not af affected, whereas, you know, the publisher, sure, it's down, but you can still show all the da data for your microservice. For us, the disadvantages we talked about, there's obviously data duplication here. We were already paying that cost with duplicating that data into Elasticsearch, and in some cases, into another Postgres. So it's not a huge disadvantage, but you know, is weighing the cost of storage on cloud providers, weighing the cost of you know, the movement of data. There's also co some complexity of setup uh, where we're maintaining or maintaining that published subscriber. So you know, the, the, the publisher goes down in terms of like the database, you're doing a restart because you're you know, upgrading the, uh, the database instance or you're upgrading the version of the database. Uh, you might you have to reestablish that publisher so that, and the subscriber so it can work. So there's operational concerns there. And the question for us is, do we have to build an operator again to handle this, or can we manage it by, you know, the SRE capabilities that we have built into our infrastructure as code? The other uh, alternative that we looked at was foreign data wrapper, that I mentioned. You know, the one demo that. Uh, was pulled together. So in this case, there was no data duplication, right? So in forwarded, foreign data wrapper, it's like a projection of a table or a, a set of tables from one uh, remote database into the local. So the way you set it up is you have credential management that happens. You're going to usually just do a read only, right? For, and uh, the local database is informed of the schema of the remote database, so you can create your query plans. And then you go and you just do SQL like all of those tables are on your local database. And it feels, again, like co-located data uh, for a developer. The disadvantages here are around query performance. You're tied to the latency of the network that you're involved in. And you have, again, those issues where if the remote database goes down, you're likely hitting an outage also. right? All right, so for all of that, for us, 
the winner was logical replication. It gave us the, uh, the amount of um, safety around that outage isolation. We were comfortable with uh, the cost of the data duplication. Uh, where we were also aware of what it cost in terms of performance on the primary database to do replication because Debezium works off of that same replication, replication slot um, capabilities built in Postgres. So the impact we knew was going to be a known impact and we were able to move forward with, with that selection. So what is the end state of this look like? So this becomes our simplified architecture. Now all of the pieces on the left look the same. Uh, again, all of these microservices had their own Postgres database. And now we get to a place where, while our first thing was to move data from uh, those kind of management services, like I mentioned, the, the advisor malware, we wanted to be able to show that data in our inventory page. We want to say, oh, how many, how many recommendations do I have? What count of malware do I have? Kind of these highlighted numbers. The intent was to get there first, but we actually shifted gears and the focus is on let's not have that short-term hack that I mentioned before and how do we replicate that inventory data first and then come back and have the other direction. But again, we can use replication where we're building tables that are specific to what we want and only replicating that data across. So here in this case, you can kind of see from inventory, we're sharing down, publishing data with our managed services, and then back the other way, we're going to be able to get the data for that highlighted information. And if you've noticed, the number of technologies has drastically reduced. So we're not supporting Elasticsearch to be able to do that. We don't have to have necessary. We may bring back operators. That's a that's a uh, a piece that we'll have to figure out. So that's going to be a potential addition of GoLang here, but. Uh, the, that's a much simpler operator than what we had before with cross-join and with uh, the other thing was just called Cindy. And so we still handle Kafka because we're still getting events from, from, from PUP2 along the way, but it becomes just a web app, right? It's just your common web app with a database. And that's a lot easier for me to talk to you about with the development team and for them to understand. And there's a lot less componentry and moving parts. And there's a lot less fear in what are my changes going to do because they understand SQL and they understand writing Python, they understand these different pieces and the frameworks. Um, and they don't have to, not that they're not interested in these other things, but you know, the, there's a reduced set of moving parts for them to be able to add in individual new features. So what did the journey look like for us to be able to do these kind of things? So we're not at step three yet, I will definitely say that. But in step one, well, how did we even approach you know, stopping this? Because well, like I said, we're a software as a service. So we use feature flags during the transition where we could basically say, we don't want to go to Elasticsearch anymore for our querying of data. We want to go directly to the Postgres database until we got to um, you know, feature complete for all of that functionality. Now for us, we were lucky. I think it was partially because we had a very tight REST API and we weren't making use of like Lucene syntax within that in, in terms of being able to do all of the things we wanted to through REST so that we could actually transition it to Postgres. So I'm not saying that this is a throw out Debezium and Elasticsearch for all things, but for us, we were capable of replacing everything with Postgres direct. And partially that is because, you know, since version 9, 10, and up of Postgres. It's support for uh, JSON queries um, of unstructured data has gotten a lot stronger, a lot faster. For us, uh, the next step was moving logical replication of data. So that's moving us off the public schema because we had a lot, of, a lot of microservices here that was just, oh, it's in the public schema. If we want to replicate stuff, the way replication works is it's going to move basically into the same namespace so we can't have collision there. So then it's a swip, switch everything to their own app services schema and then replicate stuff through the publish and subscribe mode. Uh, and then lastly, we get to the uh, bi-directional re replication where we're just replicating those tables of data back into the inventory that we need 
to be able to show that high level feature along the way. And that is the end of the presentation. Do I have any questions from the audience? Go ahead. Does it feel good to do this? Um, it's been so painful. <laughs> uh, to be honest, you know, moving parts in a live uh, software as a service is a challenge for sure. Uh, I would love, I would love to be at step three where everything's all done, and then you know the tears of joy will flow from my my face upon that. Um, but I am confident in what we're building. Like when we when we got to feature complete, I was like, okay, cool, cool. Um, we're at so this is running like this in uh, our fed ramp, uh, where we were able to divest ourselves of Elasticsearch and and Debezium there. That's that was super great for them because they were really tired of the CVEs around that that piece. But uh, you know, I haven't lost hair over it, so that's always good. You know, that's a plus. Uh, the, I had hoped to be completely done with it by end of Q2. I was I was destroyed that I, I did not manage to do it that. But uh, feature changes along the way. Uh, like I said, the endless CVEs have been kind of fun because they take people away from efforts of doing doing this kind of transition work. And you're like, well, you've got to make the dates for these things. But wholly, I think. What's been the best experience was the conversations with the engineers along the way and them seeing how things will get better, right, as they can divest themselves of some of this complexity. So yeah, that part has felt good. Anybody else? Well, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and enjoy the rest of DevCon. Yeah, tell me what Puff 2 stands for. Hmm. I did not know that. I thought somebody was a fan of dogs. <laughs> the fun part is that that's a very insight-centric view of the world, because uh, while it still does handle most of the payloads, it still it's only like, I think, three quarters of the payloads that actually come through Ingress today. Sure, but we also have payloads through, like, from cost management.